Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Martin Shalomvari. Uh, I work for SoundCloud uh, in Berlin, where our headquarters are. And we recently delivered a piece of, piece of software using D3, uh, part of our website. And I thought it would be a good idea to talk about how something using D3 made into production and being exposed to, I know, a couple of thousand users per minute. Uh, sorry. Uh, can you hear me better now? Cool. Uh, yeah, anytime you have questions, just feel free to interrupt me. I don't mind stopping and answering questions or fixing things. Uh, yeah, anyway, uh, so uh, I'm going to talk about a real life project uh, which is already like exposed to real users, real traffic, uh, and they're pretty happy so far. Uh, so I'm going to walk you through a couple of challenges we had uh, uh, on this way, by by uh, on this way, and by for delivering this project, uh, these are the four key points. Uh, first of all, you have to learn D three. That's like step zero. Uh, our uh, Sample.com is built on Backbone, and this uh, project I'm going to talk about is part of the main website. So we have to, we had to connect D3 and Backbone somehow. Uh, as for every real life project, we had to think about how to structure code because it's like part of a large code base. It's uh, like more than 10 engineers are working on the same code base. So there are rules for structuring code uh, and there are best practices for structuring code, and uh, yeah, as with everything in web development, there are problems with browsers, and we have to tame them. Uh, so what is SoundCloud? Uh, who doesn't know what SoundCloud is? Okay, I will tell what SoundCloud is. Who has music or some audio content uploaded to SoundCloud? Ah, that's pretty good, okay. So for you, <laughs> SoundCloud is like a platform for uploading your music and distributing it. And if you are a music lover, it's a place for discovering awesome music and listening to it. And it's a website, and it has mobile apps and stuff like that. But what I'm primarily talking about is the public-facing uh, desktop website, which looks like this. Uh, and the actual project I'm going to talk about is a project which helps creators by providing statistics uh, to help them understand how their, their sounds perform, how their audio content performs. Uh, or to make it simple, it's analytics for, for music and audio creators. Uh, this is how it used to look like before we started this project, because it's not something entirely new. SoundCloud always had some sort of analytics, but that's the old website, which we almost entirely replaced with our mobile web apps and the new backbone-based uh, um, soundcloud.com. Uh, this old one is a Rails monster, and we are trying to deconstruct it, and we're moving to a microservice architecture, and as part of this, we are uh, rebuilding stats. And it's not only about like facelifting or changing technology, we're trying to make it more useful, especially by removing numbers from one screen and making it more visual. Uh, so this is how it looks like now. Uh, as you see, we haven't invented any, uh, I know, super new way of presenting numbers. It's just bar charts and line charts. Uh, but 
we decided to use D3 because we had some experience with it. Uh, back, the traditional way of doing backbone applications doesn't really fit uh, this purpose. Uh, on the other hand, uh, everything else than the actual chart part is, is backbone, so I'm not gonna talk about how the other things work. Um, that's an empty slide. Uh, a few numbers about numbers. Uh, okay, it's coming. So, as I said, uh, we're building this thing to, into an ex existing uh, backbone application, it's, about, it's pretty huge, like 300,000 lines of code, including everything. Like it's, it's just front-end, like JavaScript, CSS, and HTML. Uh, the whole stats thing is backed by two RESTful services. As I said, we're moving towards a microservices architecture, so these REST services are basically like repositories of numbers, but like lots of them and they're super fast. And they, they're pretty dumb. They just answer to queries like, what was the play count over this time period for this user? And they return a bunch of numbers. So we need an intermediate service which tells you what that track actually was or what the title of the track was. So we call it BFF, which is not, woo. How do I switch this off? Anyway, please don't tweet. <laughs> okay, if anyone knows how to switch tweets out, then let me know. So we have this BFS service, which is not best friends forever, but back and forth front ends, which is basically, that's the user facing API, talking to different microservices, and knows how to authenticate, knows which data to join from which part of, of our of infrastructure. Uh, and then, so during this project, we created 70 new modules to, to this backbone application, including JavaScript, HTML, and CSS code. Uh, and the interesting part is it's 1,200 lines of code of D3, which is not super huge, but still it took a couple of months, maybe six or something, to actually, from the first commit to services, feature all that 200% users. So it's not as small as it looks like from this number. Uh, yeah, and these 1,200 lines are distributed in 10 modules. Uh, yeah, so the first challenge, uh, learn D3. Who who hasn't learned D3 yet? Okay, so advice for you, because I mean, ev learning everything new is not trivial, and you might find some guidance useful. Uh, of course, go for, there are excellent learning materials for, for D3, so go for them. Uh, once you read the tutorials and everything, make sure you really understand what the enter, update, exit, selection, and the whole uh, dumb manipulation life cycle is. And this is my personal summary of, of, of like how to look at D3. Uh, so everything is just a configurable function. Uh, and this is true for D3's API, and should be true, if you want to follow the D3 way of doing things, it should be true for your code. Uh, let's see what it actually means. Uh, so this is an example from, from DC, D3 documentation. What you do here, uh, layout stack is, is a helper for transforming your data to be useful for, to be suitable for stacked bar chart representation. They have a couple of like, cool tools, tools for, for preparing your data for, for visualization. 
So this just creates a function which is named stack here. And we configure like let's config we configure we basically configure the behavior of, of this function by calling functions on the function, which sounds like funny, but still like that's that's what we're doing. Uh, um, and then we can just use so the highlighted line is just how we use the function. It's we call the function with data input and it returns another transform data. And it's all like the behavior of the function is partially, of course, defined by implementation and partially configured by the previous calls. And I've, I've, I found very useful to understand uh, because it's like chaining function calls everywhere, but it all translates back to one function which is pre-configured by the previous fu function calls. So it helps to understand the examples and, and helps to like, set a way of doing things. Uh, so that was our second challenge because there was a huge uh, existing uh, infrastructure and, and application which works pretty well. We have our best practices, but D3 was something completely new to to, to this code base. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so we have, um, does everybody know Backbone? At least, okay. Uh, so we already had everything said. It's, it's a side working for ages, for a long time, not for ages. And we didn't really want to, to change a lot. So we decided to make a very like, uh, small interface between Backbone and D3 and keep, uh, keep D3 as a means of like, templating and leave the rest for, for Backbone, like fetching data uh, and the whole like, view lifecycle management. Um, if you, by the way, if you're interested, a second, if you're interested in how SoundCloud's Backbone app is built, uh, one of my colleagues, Nick Fisher, Nick Fisher has an excellent presentation, and we also have a, our article on our back, uh, developer blog, so just, just Google for Nick Fisher Backbone, probably. <laughs> It will show up. Sorry, what was the question? So, is the title of this slide is it saying that D3 just works well with Backbone, like it loves Backbone, or is the challenge to make D3 love Backbone? Uh, the challenge to make D3 Backbone, but it turned out that it's just not a challenge. But that's the next slide, uh, or maybe the one after. Um, yeah. Mm. So, yeah, that's what I talked about before, uh, Backbone View just wires up everything, gets the data, in, uh, it gets instantiated, uh, and once we have the data, then comes the D3 part, and we just, we just uh, use back, uh, treat uh, D3 code as a template, which, because it is a template. Like it takes data and makes it into some sort of DOM representation. Uh, so it turned out to be a good idea because uh, that's basically, that's the essence of, of the integration. It's like, it's not even interesting. Like we have, we have a view which is an SVG because we are rendering into SVG but it could, as D3 doesn't really require you to use SVG, it can be whatever you want. And we have, uh, I will talk about the first line, the very first line layer, but we have some sort of D3 chart implemented somewhere. Uh, and in our backbone app, render is called by the surrounding infrastructure but when the data is already available. And uh, we just 
configure the, the actual uh, chart implementation and call it so you see the configurable function. We configured it and then we just call this function with the element that's wrapping the whole thing, which in our case is an SVG element, and with the template data. data. This get template data is specific to our framework, but it basically returns either the backbone collection or, or the model that has been fetched before. Uh, does this make sense? Question? Question? No question. Uh, there is one, one tricky thing. Uh, uh, there is one key difference uh, between using HTML and SVG is that even though SVG has scalable in its name, you probably don't want it to scale itself because you're, you probably carefully selected the proper font size you probably carefully calculated some very subtle details by pixel or whatever. And what you really want to do is, because we are, it's like, it's the age of different sizes of screen, you want to adapt your visual representation to, to the screen size, which includes resizing screens. So that's the only difference, that's the only trick uh, which we had to implement to actually redraw uh, whenever the screen size, which implies the actual like view uh, resize. Uh, yeah, whatever. I don't know what I wanted to say. <laughs> uh, yeah, and of course, the actual implementation is far more complicated because it has to integrate with, with the ex existing uh, framework we built on top of Backbone, but everything just goes down to these two things. And that's, that's the only, only important thing. Okay, uh, so structuring code, it's like, it's not specific to D3, it's not specific to what we are doing, but uh, the problem is examples always look good. Like, oh, it's simple. It fits on a screen. It's like, wow, I understand everything. I'm like, just I just look at it. But once you're doing something like a real application, then you just have to deal with so many different requirements, uh, including an existing uh, infrastructure design requirements. So things will start growing. Um, so you, at some point, you will have to think, think about not having everything in one file, right? Uh, so in the JavaScript world, fortunately, it's becoming mainstream and common to, to, to use some sort of module format. And that's what we are doing. Uh, and that's what I recommend everyone if you start a new application and if it's meant to be a real thing, like not a, not a demo, not a hack, something that will be a product, think about using some sort of uh, module format. Uh, we use uh, CommonJS uh, because it's convenient. Uh, it's not so verbose, uh, and we, we don't, of course, the browsers don't really, the browsers can't use CommonJS directly, so we generate AMD from CommonJS. Uh, does anyone not know what AMD is? Okay, I thought it will need some explanation. So, I, I'm sure everybody knows what common J, common JS is. Uh, let me show. Okay, whatever. Uh, so common JS is uh, a module format invented for. I think it was invented for Node.js. 
but it doesn't work in the browsers for different reasons, primarily because JavaScripts are loaded asynchronously. And AMD is a way of loading models which are encapsulated the same way as CommonJS models, but they do work in browsers. The problem with them is the syntax, in my opinion, or in my team's opinion, is extremely ugly and super hard to maintain if you have more than, let's say, five dependencies. So that's why we are generating uh, AMD modules on the fly. Uh, but it doesn't really matter. Like, choose whatever format you like. You can write AMD if you want, or stick with CommonJS and use, because if you write AMD, you pr might, not want, might not need to rewrite it on the server or generate stuff from it, but uh, it doesn't really matter. Really, just choose some mod module format. Um, or go for uh, ES6 modules. You will also have to rewrite the code, but yeah, go for it. Uh, and the second important thing is what I previously mentioned. If you understand that D3 code is just configurable functions, just do it yourself with your code. Uh, and I think it will feel more natural to, to have, to look at D3 and D3 API and your code and your API, and they, they should be of the same nature. So like D3 doesn't really expose prototypes or classes or something, it just exposes functions. So should your code. But I think it's just an opinion. It's up for you. Uh, and that's, it's a quote from Mike Bastock, who's the creator of D3. To sum up, implement charts, disclosures with getter and setter methods. So that's, why, that's basically the same way of saying the same thing. And I recommend this article towards reusable charts by him, which was the starting point for me and helped me to, to go this way. Uh, so let's see how we use these two concepts to actually build things. Uh, this is more or less the same as what Mike Bostock described in this article. Uh, so we have a function outside, uh, which is like basically like the entry point for, for the whole thing. Um, we have another function named chart here, uh, which is actually returned by the outer, outside function. And we have some getters and setters. There is only one example here. So you can set the width, uh, and that will be available on the return function. If it doesn't make sense from here, it will make sense once we get to the other part, how to use it. Uh, so that's the actual module for, uh, that, that's the actual chart module <laughs> format recommended and used by, I think it's used by the D3 community pretty much. And that's, that's the common JS uh, module wrapper around. Uh, so the top two lines are the dependencies of this module because it might use something else. It does use D3. Uh, and the, the advantage of common JS modules is it clearly and explicitly declares its dependencies. And D3 is just a dependency as well. Uh, and there is module exports, which means this is the interface of this module. So from outside, you won't see anything else than this function, my chart. And here below, it's also very convenient. You can have functions at top level, top level, uh, and they will be private. They won't be exposed to any consumer of this, this uh, 
this module it won't be available anywhere. Only from, from the actual module body. Uh, so this is how, how to use a model, module like this. You have to require. So it's, a, it's just another common JS module which requires this previous, previous one. Uh, and it should be already familiar. So we create an actual instance of this configurable function. We configure it, let's say, set the width and the height. And at some point later in our code, we just use this function. So there is chart, and we call it with selection and data. Um, so that's, what, that's the interface. We decided to use every chart and every D3 component has this entry point, a function which returns a configurable function. And once the function is configured, it takes the selection and the data. Uh, So that was easy, wasn't it? Uh, is it clear until this point? Because it might get crazier. <laughs> Any questions? Okay. Um, so, as I said, things, no matter what you plan to implement, it will be more complicated and it will, it will keep becoming more and more more complicated. So like in our case, we just started with a plain bar chart, just rectangles. Then we, we added these segments for different tracks. So it's, it's a stacked bar chart. Then we added a custom uh, X axis and the custom Y axis. And they, kept becoming more and more and more and more sophisticated. So it wasn't like a, it wasn't like 100 lines of code like in the examples anymore. It was like more like 500 or getting closer to something that's not manageable like any, anymore. Uh, and that's because your business logic and your presentation logic will grow no matter what you want. It's, it's, it's just happening. Um, and then we came up with, we had to come up with some idea like how to split this up into meaningful parts and coming from the visual uh, side of it, it, it was obvious to, to split the code by defining layers. So you like look at the whole thing and take individual parts which are like just visually encapsulated independent of the other. So let's have it separately in the code as well. Uh, so that's it. There is one main module which is like still the main entry point. Still has the same interface I showed before. Uh, and what it does is it, it it has it, it accesses the other layers as common JS modules, and they have a very similar interface, but they don't work on the whole thing. They only work on some part of it, uh, and they are responsible for one thing, like y, our custom y-axis, a custom uh, custom uh, bar chart, the layer. Uh, the stacked, stacked bar chart. And you might think that there will be code duplication by moving stuff into separate modules. But in practice, uh, in my experience, it's, it's not really true. Uh, because they're, that's the reason why, you, why they're separate. There's not much in common between them except for D3. And if there is something that's common, you can still create another module which is imported by the two others. Uh, so I think that's like a general practice of, of uh, code mod moduli modularization, which is true for <coughs> any other uh, software. Uh, 
Oh, yeah. So the last advantage is they are not only reusable, but they are testable separately, which saves you a lot. You don't have to test the whole thing in one piece. Uh, and talk about testing. You should test your D3 modules. Uh, who has ever tested something built in D3? Okay, some people, that's good, <laughs> but not so many. Uh, but everything should be tested, at least have some tests. Uh, and it turns out that if you have these small modules which don't do many things, just a few, uh, unit testing them is, it's, it's not trivial, but it's simple. So they are isolated. They just take, the, take some data, output some DOM or manipulate some DOM. So you just have to make some assertions on the DOM uh, created or manipulated by D3. Uh, and preferably, if you have time, because you separated things, so then you're connecting them again, so you should test them in this integrated state as well. But if you only do unit testing, I will forgive you. Uh, so that's how, how a simple test looks like. Uh, remove some boilerplate around, but uh, our test just create an empty SVG element. We're using jQuery uh, in the test and the actual application as well. So it's convenient to use jQuery to create stuff and, and look at stuff. Um, and the interesting part is it's just three simple steps. Create some test data, call the char drawing function and and the good thing is there is no backbone involved, no Ajax involved. You don't have to mock Ajax calls or something. It's just purely about the DOM manipulating D3 functions. Uh, so we create the test data. We call the chart function with the test SVG and the test data. And we make some assertions like has this function created two rectangles, which means we wanted to probably render as many rectangles as the data points are. Uh, or you can assert some attributes to be set by D3. Uh, this is actually a bad test because these asserts should be in separate tests, but whatever. Uh, good, so much about testing. Test. Uh, so you, uh, SVG is not a new thing. It's like maybe 15 years old. <laughs> uh, but in browsers, it's still pretty new. Like it's everywhere. Almost every browser, mo every modern browser has SVG support. But it's it's only or only since a couple of years. Like maybe three something. So, uh, but actually, compared to this kind of young age in browsers, it works pretty well. There was, there were only a few corner cases. So we are supporting modern browsers. There is no IE7 involved. <laughs> if you have to deal with IE7 with SVG, that's probably better to do on the server, but we didn't have to do this. Uh, so if, you, if, you, if you're starting a real project and you know which browsers you have to support, just make sure, make sure you're 100% sure you know what's working where. Use, can I use that com? Uh, so that was the only big challenge, but we wasted like maybe weeks on making things uh, sharp. Like in HTML, you really have to make efforts to make things not sharp. In SVG, you have to make efforts to make things sharp. And the thing is, 
it sounds like a trivial thing. Like, let's draw a line which is one pixel wide, and it's like 10 pixel long, and it's it's uh, it's horizontal, so it should be sharp because the pixels are also horizontal. Uh, so you expect this. It's like one. It's like a one pixel wide black line. But you usually get this. It's like two pixel wide gray line. <laughs> and it's actually not a bug. It's as according to the SVDG specifications, spe specification strokes, that's how they call lines or borders, have to are uh, placed on the pixel boundaries. So if you have something that's not exactly one pixel, or uh, not exactly uh, whatever, if you have one pixel, that will be placed on the pixel boundary, split into half, and then anti-aliased into gray. Thanks, SVG. Uh, why should you care? It's like, oh, I only draw circles. There will be anti-aliased anyway. Or, or my lines are never horizontal or vertical. So, but in real life, you might want to work, you might have to work with specifications like this. This has to be exactly like that because we are perfectionists. Or, yeah, uh, it really looks better if it's perfectly one pixel sharp. Uh, so, in some cases, you might still have to do this. And it turns out it's it's not an uncommon problem if you look at Stack Overflow, and I think it's one of the most common D3 problems on Stack Overflow, which has nothing to do with D3, actually. It's just, I know, D3 is making SVG mainstream or something, but people complain about not sharp lines. And that's the trick. Like, they have to be at half pixel, or like something plus half. Uh, but the bad news is it doesn't work always. Uh, it should work in theory. Uh, and, and after the two weeks of experimenting with everything, we came up with something that fixes. We gave up on IE. We fired, we fired the bug with Microsoft. Uh, we more or less fixed uh, Firefox by using shape rendering crisp edges, which is supposed to turn the, the rendering engine into something that only renders crisp edges. Uh, but problem is, it triggers an algorithm in other browsers with all the different kinds of rounding errors. So <laughs> you got the sharp pixel, but it might not be where you expect it. Uh, so like it or not, that's that's, like if anyone comes up with a solution for for this, like having these sharp pixels everywhere, uh, I will invite you for twenty beers or something. Question: Is there any reason you can't just detect that it's a Firefox browser and only apply the shape that's, rendering on that? Yeah, that's what we're doing. Okay. But hey, IE is are broken by it. No, no, no. Uh, browsers not mentioned here behave. Well, with with the 0.5 pixel fix, which is actually according to the standard, and we are conditionally applying this uh, shape rendering thing for uh, Firefox. Uh, there weren't many other browser quirks, which was a very good surprise for me. Uh, except for some strange behaviors when doing uh, CSS transi transitions, but they can be replaced by D3 trans transitions usually. Uh, so sometimes you have to switch between them to, to make things actually work. Uh, okay, uh, to summarize everything, uh, as I said, it turned out to be a good idea for me to, for us, for our team, and for the existing code base to separate things and treat D3 as more like a template, uh, draw, tra templating library. 
limit complexity by modular, modularizing, uh, by refactoring all the time, like, because complexity is just coming. Uh, yeah, hint, JS hint has recently discovered it has a flag, I think it's max complexity. You can actually make JS hint tell you this function is too complicated, complex, whatever, refactor it. Uh, haven't tried it, but it's promising. Uh, so refactor when it gets too complex. Uh, and it's not only true for functions, for modules as well. Testing is not scary, do testing. Uh, learn about sharpness, I just told. Ah, and that's it. Uh, we have time for questions. Uh, questions. So I'm a big SoundCloud fan, and one of the things that I think of when I think of SoundCloud, which is even in your logo, is the waveform of the audio file, right? So when, when you're on any track on SoundCloud, it shows you the audio waveform. Yes. Like you took it off the slide, but if you go back one, it's like on your logo, right? Uh, like the, the tiny thing in the box. So I just wondered, like, do you do that? Do you render the waveform in D3, or do you use something else? Uh, we're not using D3 anywhere else than, 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 than on this analytics page. Uh, the waveform is Canvas, actually. Canvas. Uh, it used to be like static files, but now it's it's cameras. Well, I can't really tell you. It's, it wasn't me. <laughs> yes. When you test for different browser vendors, how many versions back do you go? Uh, we generally support every browser and two previous versions. I think we don't support any IE older than nine. But for the others, it's like recent minus two. Yeah. Um, is there a role uh, in this integration of D3 and Backbone for Backbone collections and models, or are you just kind of using them in the normal way? And it, or you didn't really talk about that. Can you talk about that a little bit? Uh, how we use the question was the question how we use backbone models and collections and like for instance I've seen you know like you can if you're loading JSON data directly into D3 you might have it load that and process it and stuff as opposed to like say doing it in a collection with backbone or do you have any opinion about that kind of thing? Uh, once you have like integration between backbone and your backends which might involve uh, building URLs in a specific way, setting cookies, whatever, authentication. You probably want to do whatever the rest of your application does. Uh, but it was just convenient for us because it's already there. You just have to uh, create a model and it works. Uh, for some other uses you might want, you can actually go, like, you can circumvent backbone if you want, but that's not what we wanted. Does it answer your question? Uh, not exactly. I'll, I'll maybe I can take a look at the code and decide that it has a number. Okay, we can talk about the presentation. One more question. What are you using? For, you said you build your modules on the fly. What are you using? Uh, it's, it's a custom server and a custom build script by us. But there are existing tools for that, like open source. Uh, they weren't really there when we started this whole thing, like one and a half years or maybe two years ago. Nowadays, we probably would rely on something existing. But it's, it's actually not something super crazy rocket science. It just takes a JavaScript file and prepends some stuff and appends some stuff and it's it's already an AMD module. Okay. Uh, thank you.